there's going to be two talks of sorts. One is uh, the work I did early trying to figure out how to use GSAS one with a laboratory machine. Uh, we, of course, are married to lab machines in our interest of measuring lattice parameters owing to the copper source and their stability. The second is the quantitative phase analysis. Um, okay, these are the models contained in GSAS. Um, uh, the latest was the, the asymmetry correction due to finger. Uh, these don't have much to do with uh, laboratory data, except that they are, of course, Gaussian and Lorentzian functions that we all know and love. Uh, this was the object of attention from 1989 to 1994, when I sought to rationalize it <clears throat> completely with um, a full reverse engineering. Uh, the people at Siemens were, to say the least, surprised at what we did. I got involved with uh, Bob Sherry about two years into the effort. And we used the early version, the, the precursor to Topaz called the XFIT to uh, characterize what was going on. This machine, of course, is equipped with a Johansson incident beam monochromator that imposes a otherwise somewhat Gaussian bandpass filter on the otherwise Lorentzian emission spectrum from copper. Oh, what did I do? Okay. This is um, a chart of the aberrations uh, leading to the geometric component of the instrument profile function from the lab machine. Uh, these were mostly developed by Wilson and published in 1963. Uh, the axial divergence model is uh, um, Chiri and Coleo, and then there's the um, PSD defocusing is actually Marcus. So this is this is a, a modern chart, but the major premise of what this says is that all laboratory powder diffractometers, if evaluated using empirical methods for instrument characterization, should behave the same only as a function of the optical configuration. This may seem straightforward now, but in fact, this was in opposition to particularly the senior membership of the American community. The Europeans were kind of scratching their heads a little bit. Um, these are the empirical ways that we do this. When I qualify an instrument, I start out with simply profile fitting and considering these uh, <laughs> metrics here. So this is the full width half max of your basic lab machine. This is relatively, <clears throat> this thing have a pointer in it? No, I flew it. Okay, um, what's going on is the, uh, the high angle broadening is due to angular dispersion. Not, not at all surprising. The low angle is due to the incident beam slit, uh, the black specimen error. Uh, if you use a, a more high resolution setting, the, the upturn at low angle will go away. So this is the delta two theta where you plot the observed angle uh, minus the certified one. And again, uh, this is, can be explained quantitatively. The low angle displacement is, is, towards low angle is due to the flat specimen error and axial divergence, whereas the high angle is due to the angular dispersion and also the axial divergence. So this plot here is mid 1990s data that was successfully duplicated with simulations in XFIT. This allowed us to assert ourselves that the machine was indeed fully rationalized and it didn't do any good to 
get data that you were going to try to use with GSAS that you didn't know was kosher. So we now knew we had it. So we consider what's going on in the GSAS parameters we can use, and we separate them into two groups, not surprisingly at this point. Ones are specific to the, to the instrument, and the others are specific to the specimen. So we see the U is going to account for the um, angular dispersion. Um, the V we want to allow to go negative, and it'll account for the um, low values in the center portion. Uh, the the GCP, the particle size protein Gaussian, we almost never use. And then we'll refine the, the size and strain broadening. The strain, of course, it maps into the angular dispersion. So your basic LAB6 refinement. And so this thing doesn't have a pointer on it, right? Does it have a pointer? Yes. That's a NIST gadget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll start with the profile shape parameters. The, the sometimes the G to V would indeed go negative. If it goes positive, then you set it at zero and fix it. The G sub U and the G sub W are rational. The G sub P is vanishingly small. The LX and LY are in decent correspondence. The parameters associated with the finger model um, really didn't care whether or not you were using a standard or not. And they didn't, once they refined to fixed value, you could shut them off. And the transmission or the, the transparency and the shift are specific to the sample, so you always refine them. Um, what we see is a, a pretty decent fit from the, the residuals. I will say that the original axial divergence model in the early 90s was not good at all. We, we realized a dramatic improvement with the finger. Um, the lattice parameters are in fact off by about 50 femtometers, which is about five times what we think we know the value to be. That's because the delta two theta curve that we know and love for powder machines is not being duplicated in the parameters available on GSAS. So then you go and find, refine a lower symmetry material that doesn't display preferred orientation like we like our SRMs. And you shut off the values or set them as floors and then refine only the values associated with the sample broadening. So we shut off all the uh, UVW, G sub P goes, it, again, it, it almost never refined and the LX and LY are telling us what we want to know about the specimen. Again, the, uh, the anisotropic stuff, uh, it didn't seem to care. We get rational terms for the Lorentz polarization and the temperature <clears throat> factors. However, we uh, a few years ago figured, realized that the models for polarization were actually incorrect. So, all right, second half of the talk. Um, everybody knows and loves quantitative analysis. Uh, there's a problem, however, that you have to assume but you hate it. No, you're half right. <laughs> <laughs> the key problem is that uh, in the nomenclature of the RIR is that you have to have accounted for all of the crystalline materials in your specimens. This is sort of impossible. So this is a plot of the uh, layer thickness versus percent amorphous content versus particle size. And we can see that for completely rational powders, a substantial portion of the material may well be amorphous. Uh, there's no such thing as a, a finely divided solid that doesn't have an amorphous component associated with it.
the diffraction experiment, of course, can only see the crystal. So here we are with Riedfeld, uh, GSAS, and again, we have the same problem that you have to assume uh, you know all of the materials in your testament, which you can't. So if you had a suitable standard that was certified with respect to its amorphous content, you would get another equation that would allow you to solve this issue and measure the amorphous content of an unknown. So, of course, it is, that's what we set out to do. Um, this is an example of a 1990s type high quality study that um, there were numerous papers of this type where you basically would see the authors preparing synthetic mixtures of something they were interested in and then measuring it and say, see, I got the right answer. And this, this is commendable and all that, but it really isn't very useful in figuring out what the metrological limits are on quantified powder diffraction. So this is the kind of thing that we do here. All right, so very early on, I started working with Bob and on specimens about which I know knew a fair amount. And what we found out right away was that neutrons are always right and live X-rays are always wrong. <laughs> always? <laughs> uh, this is illustrated in, here with, we see the two neutron data sets. Um, that are we're, we're mixed with SRM 676A, which has 1% amorphous material in it. And we get rational numbers that indicate the quartz is of lower or higher amorphous content than the standard was, which is what we expect slash no. Okay, we look at the x-ray results. And if you look at these numbers, it's actually telling us that the quartz is more pure or uh, than the SRM 676A, which is impossible. Every, every data set I have ever looked at on any SRM that I've worked with has always shown slight bias in the laboratory data. I've simply never seen anything else. So all the SRMs for quant are certified with neutrons. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out how to measure amorphous content in an absolute context. We're going to start out with silicon uh, that we are going to wave our arms and say is crystallographically perfect and therefore all the oxide is on the surface. And then we're going to prepare 50-50 mixtures of silicon and alumina and we're going to fractionate the silicon by particle size and therefore plot its surface area versus refined mass fraction. It turned out the biggest experimental problem of doing this was the silicon was in fact fractionated in isopropanol and the, the, the isopropanol would deposit a layer of gook on the silicon, which uh, it took us 15, year, 15 years or so to figure out how to get it fully removed. We're still improving on it, but we'll go there. Okay, so you generate this plot and you extrapolate to a mythical silicon that doesn't have any surface area and therefore it's 100% pure. And this gives you the phase purity of your alumina. Uh, the slope of the line, however, is specific to the oxide layer thickness on the silicon. This gives you an added check for uh, experimental self-consistency. Oh, damn it. Okay, this is version one. Um, this was mid 1990s, maybe 96, 97. And the only thing we were really willing to say about it is that it appeared that the experimental design worked. Uh, so the silicon employed in this was quite unsuitable. So this is version three. Uh, this is the certification of 676A where we had three sets of data. 
that basically concurred with one another. Um, this SRM, well, there was a workshop given at Denver on use of or measurement of amorphous content and unknowns and the sales rates of the, this guide increased by 30 or 40 percent. So the community became aware of the fact that with the use of this standard, they could in fact measure amorphous content in unknowns. So it sold out several years ago and I have tons of email, but okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> this is in fact 676B, it does exist, we are working on it, and this is some beautiful data that we got from Polaris. Um, the other nice thing about it is that we uh, were able to realize a more credible uh, value for the oxide layer thickness on the silicon. This was through the, the improved technique we used or had developed for purifying silicon. So, um, a couple of conclusions. One is that being who we are, we would love to see the FPA incorporated into GSAS too. So. <laughs> it's on my list. <laughs> Send the, <laughs> the other statement I would Emails make. Emails haven't worked too well with him. <laughs> the other statement has to do with quant, and you hear rumblings about another round robin through the IUCR. Uh, I'm not a fan of this because I believe that some fundamental work needs to be done on the metrology issues because there's just, we don't understand what's wrong. So, thank you.